author and dating coach Logan Yuri is a 2018 TED resident, behavioral economics researcher, and dating coach. Um, <clears throat> maybe she has some free time to do some fun things too. Uh, she's currently writing a book with Simon and Schuster on how to make better decisions in romantic relationships. She studied psychology at Harvard University and formerly ran the Irrational Lab, which is Google's behavioral economics team, alongside Dan Ariely who is author of Predictably Irrational. She works with mating and captivity author Esther Perel on a variety of projects. Perhaps you've heard of Esther. Uh, and she also collaborates with relationship scientist Dr. John Gottman and the Gottman Institute on articles and a video series, The Emotional Bank Account and the Easiest Way to Improve Your Relationship. She started the Talks at Google Modern Romance series where she interviewed world-renowned dating and relationship experts. She discussed monogamy and marriage with Dan Savage and Esther Perel and the secrets to a happy marriage with Drs. John and Julie Gottman. She's written about dating and relationships for Time, Thrive Global, Pop Sugar, The Forward, P.S. I Love You, and more. She was featured on several recent episodes of HBO's Vice News Tonight about the Me Too movement. And she recorded her TED Talk, Designing for Love, in June 2018. So she's been very, very busy, and we're very, very happy to have her. The talk today is called Irrationally Ever After. Modern dating is experiencing a seismic shift. Dating apps offer seemingly infinite options. We're faced with far more questions than ever before. Who should I date? Should I play hard to get? Should we break up? Should we get married? With her dual expertise in the areas of decision making and relationship science, Logan Yuri is here to help. In this talk, she'll provide practical research-backed ways to navigate the complexities of dating today, and there are many. After this talk, we're gonna have a really exciting Q&A again together, so please welcome, without further ado, to the stage, Logan Yuri. Okay, I'm Logan Yuri, and I'm so excited to spend the next 45 minutes with you talking about love, dating, and human behavior. So first of all, are we in control of our decisions? We'd like to think that we're rational, right? That we make decisions carefully, that we weigh the pros and cons. But according to behavioral science, that's not true. Behavioral science is the delightful love child of economics and psychology. It's the study of how and why we make decisions. And one of the key principles of behavioral science is that we're all irrational. We make decisions in ways that are not useful for us. We often make decisions that are not in our own best interest. So for example, we make decisions that are not in our own best interest, like doing things like saying we want to lose weight and then filling up our plates in the buffet as if it's the last time we'll ever eat. Or we say we want to save money, and then the next day we buy a ticket for an expensive vacation. So the truth is, we're all driven by these irrational forces. But the good news is that those forces are predictable. If we understand the irrational forces that are driving our behavior, we can make better decisions. And for years, I applied this knowledge at Google. I ran a behavioral science team there. I applied insights from behavioral science to change the behavior of Google employees and Google customers. But at the same time, I was single. Uh, the dating apps had just come out, Tinder was brand new, and I was spending all of my time swiping right and swiping left. And I looked around me at other people who were dating, and here's what I found. People were really struggling. People were having a hard time figuring out who to date, if they were ready to settle down, how to create a relationship. And I started to do more research into this topic. And I realized that we're experiencing a seismic shift in our dating culture. First of all, dating is actually pretty new. Dating was only invented in 1890. That's when people started moving out of their homes for the first time and moving to work opportunities in cities. So, for most of human history, your family or your community chose who you were going to be with. It's actually pretty new that we get to make this decision for ourselves. In the past, it was a financial or a political decision. Maybe your family got 10 camels for your hand in marriage. Or maybe you decided to marry the guy next door so that your two pieces of land could be joined. So it's actually a pretty new thing that we're figuring out who we want to marry. There's also just so many choices right now. 
When Steve Jobs announced the iPod, he said, now we have a thousand songs in our pockets. And with Tinder, we have a thousand or maybe hundreds of thousands of dates in our pocket. We just have so many choices to choose from. In the past, you maybe married Bill or Belinda down the street. But now, you're like this woman. You have so many options. Also, another issue in our dating culture is that we have limited role models. When you look at how people learn, one of the most important ways that we learn is through role models. We look at the people around us and we do what they do. And unfortunately, many of us do not have parents that are married. We are, as psychotherapist Esther Perel says, the children of the divorced and the disillusioned. In fact, in the United States, 50% of marriages end in divorce, 10% of couples are separated, and 5% of couples say they are chronically miserable. So that means two-thirds of couples have either broken up or they're in unhappy relationships. So when we're looking around for these relationship role models, many of us don't find them. And finally, we often feel alone in our problems. Imagine that you're deciding whether you want to stay with your boyfriend or not. You go on Instagram and you see all these couples that have seemingly perfect relationships. And you're swiping and you're swiping and you see everyone's perfect weekend and the kiss on the Ferris wheel. And it feels like everyone has the perfect relationship except for you. We have these private problems and they make us feel so alone. To top it all off, we know how important relationships are. Research shows that our health, happiness, and overall life satisfaction hinge on the quality of our relationships. Society tells us this is the most important decision that we can make. In her book, Lean In, Facebook COO Sheryl Sandberg says, for women, the number one decision you can make in your career is will I have a life partner and who will that person be? Okay, so let's review. We have freedom to define our identities and choose our partners, which is new in the span of human history. Add to that way more people to choose from, a lack of relationship role models, the privatization of our problems and the fact that we feel like we're the only ones not in a perfect relationship, and then society telling us how important relationships are. Is it any question that this is how we're feeling? We're feeling overwhelmed. When I thought about this issue, I realized relationships are actually a series of decisions. Am I ready to date? Who should I date? Should we break up? Should we get married? On and on, a series of decisions. And this made me feel happy because decisions are what I understand. I study behavioral science. I look at how and why we make decisions. And I realized that if I applied behavioral science, I could actually help people make better decisions in their romantic relationships. So that's what I decided to do. After almost 10 years in tech, I quit my job, and now I work full-time as a relationship writer, researcher, and dating coach. I even dabble in some matchmaking. And today I'm going to share a few of these insights with you. I'm writing a book on the topic, but today I've selected six fun examples of ways that behavioral science can help you make better decisions in dating. All right, so an early question I get from my dating clients is how do I set up my profile? To think about this, I want to share some research from behavioral economist Dan Ariely. He's one of the leading behavioral economists. This is an experiment that he ran at Duke University with, with students in the business school. He showed them two options for a subscription to The Economist magazine. And he said, which one would you choose? A, an online-only subscription for $59, or B, a print and web subscription for $125. Now, what would you choose? Right, if you're anything like me or these students, you choose the cheaper option. 68% of people chose online only for $59. Then, Ariely switched up the experiment. With a separate group of students in the same business school at the same university, he now showed it to them with three options. There was option A, online for $59, a new option B, print only for $125, and then option C, print and web for $125. What did the students choose now? 
all of a sudden, 84% of students chose option C, print and web for $125. The rest chose option A, luckily nobody chose option B. What's so fascinating about this is that it's the same group of students, the same school, the, the same characteristics, but all of a sudden, they choose a dramatically different option just because they added option B. Here's why this happened. Our brains like to make decisions by comparing similar things. So in the first experiment, we compared based on price, and we chose the cheaper option. For this one, when you add in option B, now it's really easy to compare the two choices that it costs $125. Option B is the same as option C, you just get less value. Option B makes option C look more desirable. And that's why more people choose it, and that's why The Economist ran their ad this way. Option B is merely there to get you to choose the more expensive option. And that's because in this example, option B is what's known as a decoy. And this proves something called the decoy effect. Our brains make decisions by comparing similar things and then choosing the more desirable option. This also works with physical attractiveness. Take this guy, for example. He's pretty cute, right? What happens when we compare Doug Pitt to his older brother, Brad Pitt? <laughs> Suddenly, Doug Pitt doesn't look so attractive. And that's because in this example, Doug Pitt is a decoy. He's a similar but slightly less attractive version. And here's the takeaway for dating. For your profile picture, pose with a less attractive decoy. Someone who looks like you, but is slightly less attractive. That's why I wasn't thrilled to see my face all over Selena Gomez's Tinder profile. <laughs> okay, so you've got your picture out of the way, but maybe you're still talking to your ex. Is this a problem? This is a question I'm asked all the time. To answer this one, I want to tell you about some research from Harvard University professor Dan Gilbert. Dan Gilbert ran an experiment where he had students take a photography workshop. They would spend the week taking pictures on Harvard's campus, and then over the weekend, they'd learn how to develop the film. In the first weekend that he ran this experiment, at the end of the weekend, he said to the students, you get to choose one picture that we're going to send to London to be in an exhibition there. At the end of the second weekend, he said to the students, you're going to choose one picture that we're going to send to London for an exhibition there, but we're also going to call you in a few days and see if you want to change your mind. What Gilbert found is that most students in the second weekend did not change their mind about what picture they wanted to select. But when he interviewed them about how satisfied they were with their selection, students in the second weekend were way less satisfied than students in the first weekend. And this is because of something called changeability, the opportunity to change our mind. It turns out we're pretty bad at understanding what will make us happy. We think that having the ability to change our mind is a good thing, but in reality, that's not true. Here's how it works. Your brain is really, really good at making you feel good about a final decision that you make. It's rationalization. There's a concept called cognitive dissonance, our brain does not like to hold two conflicting thoughts at the same time. So it will work and it will go into overdrive to make you feel good about your decisions. So the students in weekend one, they chose a picture, their brain said, great job, that was a great photo. The students in weekend two, they spent all week saying, should I have chosen this other one? Did I choose the right picture? What will the people in England think of me? And they just, they went crazy thinking about all the different choices that they could have made. So even though they didn't actually shift their decision, what they had in their head was this pro-con list of all the reasons why maybe they made the wrong choice. So the takeaway here is that we often think we want to have the ability to change our mind, but we're happier when we have the ability to make irreversible final decisions. And that's why you should stop talking to your ex. <laughs> I have a feeling this applies to a lot of people in this room. And why this works is that I know it's really tempting to want to text your ex, to want to communicate with them, and it seems really harmless. But it's not. Because by keeping the option open, you're not allowing your brain to go into that rationalization mode, and you're actually holding yourself back. The much better thing to do is to make that an irreversible decision, 
stop contacting your ex, break off communication with them, block them on Facebook, block them on Instagram, and this will actually open up the space for you to really find someone new and find happiness. Okay, so you have their profile picture, your ex is out of the way. How do you choose from seemingly endless options? I know this is a problem for a lot of people. There's famous research from Columbia psychologist Sheena Iyengar. She went to a gourmet grocery store in Northern California, and on some days she set up a table where you could sample one or many of 24 different types of jams. So blackberry, raspberry, strawberry, etc. And on other days, her table had six different types of jams. She saw what happened on the different days that she had the different number of jams. So, on the days with sick jams, 40% of people in the store stopped to sample the jams. When it was 24 jams, 60% of people stopped. Okay, so there's more jams, it's more exciting, people come over. Let's see how many jams they try. For six jams, people try an average of two. With 24 jams, people also try an average of two. Now here's where it gets interesting. Of the people who sampled the jams, how many of them actually purchased? 30% of people who tried the six jams, or sampled from the six jams, actually made a purchase. But when it came to people who had tried it on the day with 24 jams, only 3% of people bought jams. And this is because of something called the paradox of choice. This is a term that was coined by Swarthmore psychologist Barry Schwartz. The paradox of choice is the idea that more choices actually makes us less happy. This is very similar to the Gilbert photography study I just told you about. We're really bad at predicting what will make us happy. So we think the ability to change our mind will make us happy, but that's not true. And we think more choices and more options will make us happy, but that isn't the case. And I'm gonna tell you why. One reason is something called choice overload. When we have too many options, we can get really overwhelmed. And in that situation, we may make no choices. That's what happened with the jam study. People who saw the table with six jams said, okay, there's six jams, I know I don't like strawberry, I do like blackberry, I tried this new one, I'm gonna get it. And they felt like they could make a choice. People with the 24 jams, they said, there's no way that I could figure out which one I like the most, so they just gave up. So oftentimes when we have so many options, we make no choice. Another issue is that when there's lots of options, we actually experience a lot of regret. It's similar to the photography study. We say, I should have chosen this one, or would I be happier if I had chosen that one? And with each increasing choice, it multiplies our regret. And so what happens is, the more choice we have, often the more lonely, depressed, and worried we are. And that's why when it comes to dating, my advice for you is to limit your options. I realize this is really challenging. There are so many people you could date on these apps, but there are some techniques that you can use to actually limit it. So one thing to do is not open 100 conversations with different people on the apps. Open a few conversations, try to get to the dates as soon as possible, see how you like those people, and move on. One of my dating coaching clients, she has a rule that she came up with herself that she never sees more than three people in the early stages of dating. This gives her enough time to get to know them and compare how she feels in the relationships, but she doesn't get overwhelmed and she doesn't forget what she's saying on the different dates. <laughs> it's actually a pretty common problem. I once went on 8.5 dates in a week. It was tough. So I know this one is hard, but I want you to try to limit your options. And instead of seeing Tinder's many choices as an advantage, see it as something that's actually hard and it's holding you back and try to create constraints for yourself. Speaking of all those options, another issue I often see is people who are burned out from dating. A lot of my coaching clients come to me and say, Logan, I've been dating for the last six years. I've gone on over a hundred dates. It's just not working out for me and every time I go into a date I have a negative mindset where I think it's not going to work out this time because it hasn't worked out any of the other times. And I like to tell them about some research from psychologist Richard Wiseman. He recruited people who self-described as either lucky or unlucky. 
he brought them into a room and he gave each of them a newspaper. And he said, count how many photographs are in this newspaper. The self-described unluckies took over two minutes to do the assignment. The luckies figured it out in a few seconds. The reason why is that on page two of the newspaper, half the page in a giant font, it said, stop counting. There are 43 photographs in this newspaper. <laughs> the lucky people saw that. The unlucky people didn't. He even went a step further. Towards the end of the newspaper, he put another giant ad that said, if you see this ad, show it to the experimenter, and you will receive 250 pounds. None of the unlucky people found it, and none of them collected the money. The reason for this is that your attitude matters. What Richard Wiseman found is that people who are lucky create and find opportunities for themselves. They believe that the world is working in their favor, they have a positive attitude, and they are actually able to create these opportunities. But the good news is that this can be changed. Richard Wiseman created a program he calls the Luck School, and he was actually able to train those unluckies to see opportunities. And you can do the same thing for yourself with dating. Because the truth is, whether you think the date will go well or you think the date will go poorly, you're right. Your attitude going into the date matters so much. If you think that you're burned out and it's just going to be a bad experience, take a break from dating. Take a few months off. Go volunteer. Work out. Do something other than dating and come back when you have a positive mindset. And if you want some tips on how to create a positive mindset, here's what I tell my clients to do before a date. I have them create a pre-date ritual. It's something that you do before a date that helps you get into that positive mindset. So for example, one of my clients does jumping jacks, another one calls her best friend in New York, and they have a positive conversation. You could even listen to some of your favorite music or stand-up comedy. But I want you going into these dates thinking that they will go well because you have a huge impact on how the date turns out. Speaking of those dates, people say to me sometimes, it feels like the perfect person is always one swipe away. Why is that? Well, it turns out there's something where there's an optical illusion effect. When we only have the broad, blurry image of somebody, they seem perfect. But when we get to know them up close, we get to see their specific flaws, and suddenly they don't see that, seem that perfect anymore. A really interesting example of this happens in the corporate world. When companies are hiring a CEO, they get to decide between an internal hire, promoting somebody from within, or an external hire. With the internal person, they know that person intimately. They know their strengths and they know their weaknesses. But when it comes to the external hire, all they see is a broad, blurry image that emphasizes their strengths. This might be why external CEOs are often paid more and perform worse. I call this the Monet effect. Something seems really beautiful from far away, but when you get up close, you see all of its imperfections. This happens on dates all the time. You're swiping on a dating app and somebody seems perfect. And then you show up on the date and you're sitting across from them in a restaurant and suddenly you notice, wow, they have really bad table manners, they made a really bad joke, I don't like the sound of their voice, suddenly their flaws are just screaming at you. So you take a break and you go to the bathroom, and I know many of you do this, you pull out your phone and you start going on the dating apps. I call this the wipe and swipe. <laughs> and so you're in the bathroom and you, you find the next person on Tinder and they look perfect. So you go back out to the date and you've kind of given up on it because they have so many flaws and you just found the love of your life on the dating app and it's only a matter of time before you get together. And this happens over and over and over again. This cycle of thinking someone's perfect, showing up, seeing their flaws, rejecting them, and then doing it all over again. So my advice to you is to remember, even Prince Charming has morning breath. Everyone has flaws, including you, and it's only a matter of time before you find them. So instead of looking for a perfect person, realize that no one's perfect. And I don't want you to keep endlessly swiping, waiting for someone perfect. I want you to realize that we're all flawed and that at a certain point you need to show up to a date 
be present, give the person a chance, and really get to know them. Finally, how can you design a better date? Let's talk about colonoscopies. <laughs> Research from behavioral economist Daniel Kahneman found that in certain situations, people prefer colonoscopies that are actually slightly longer. How could this be? In those situations, the colonoscopies end in a slightly less painful way than the rest of the procedure. This demonstrates something called the peak end rule. We disproportionately remember things based on how they end. So here's my dating takeaway for you. You can save a bad date by ending on a high note. Imagine that you go on a date and you accidentally insult your date's shoes, or you do what I did once and you take a vegetarian to a steak restaurant. You can actually recover from this experience by ending on a high note. You can order a delicious dessert. You can give them a meaningful compliment. You can even go in for a good night kiss. If you end on a high note, you may actually be able to save the date. OK, so now I want to cover what we talked about today. First of all, we're irrational. We behave in these ways that are really often not in our best interests. Luckily, we're rational in predictable ways. We're experiencing a seismic shift in our dating culture. We're getting to decide who we want to marry. There's way more options. We lack relationship role models. And we're really impacted by the perfect seeming relationships that we see on social media. Plus, there's a ton of pressure to make the right decision. We can also see that relationships are a series of decisions. Who to date, who to marry, when to break up, all of these questions. And that's why understanding behavioral science and how your brain works can help you make better decisions and avoid these mistakes. So I want to review for you the six takeaways that we have for ways that we can apply behavioral science to our dating lives. Don't forget, pose with a less attractive decoy. Someone who looks like you, but is slightly less attractive. Stop talking to your ex. Limit your options. I know it's hard, but I want you to actually see the many options of the dating apps as an obstacle and not a privilege. Mind your mindset. Your attitude going into these dates is going to determine how well they go. Give people a chance. Even Prince Charming has morning breath. Everyone has flaws, so you really need to go on a date, give people a chance, and see where it takes you. And finally, you can save a bad date by ending on a high note. And that's why I have a sweet treat for you under your chairs, because I wanted to end this talk on a high note. So you can reach under your chairs for a little surprise. Thank you. Okay, cool. Uh, well, well, thank you, Logan. I'm just going to kick off the Q&A with a, a, cu a couple quick starters, and then I want to hand it over to you guys because I'm sure you have a lot of questions. I was thinking while this talk was happening, I wish we had someone in the audience whose job it was was just to record the number of cell phones that went up per slide. <laughs> because I saw a lot of people taking pictures during these stop talking to your ex slides. Yes. Like maybe half the auditorium is like, I'm like, is that just a personal note or is there a special friend that you're like, <laughs> oh, yeah, she's, she needs For that one. For a friend. Yeah. Uh, well, Interestingly, Logan, you said something fascinating, which was that you once went on 8.5 dates in a week. Uh, that was a very deliberate choice of words because that wasn't an average. So I want you to tell me about that 0.5 date. I'm glad you asked me about that. So the 0.5 date was somebody where I didn't think we were on a date, but he did. <laughs> so I'll kind of average it out to be half a date. We didn't go on a second date. At what point in the date did you realize, or the non-date, did you realize it was not a date? Uh, I think it was, it was between date. the appetizer and the entree when he said, this is my first date since my divorce. Ah. 
very awkward. I, we need another panel where we just share stories like this and maybe just hold each other and cry for a little while. <laughs> uh, that's fantastic. So, so listen, I, I assume when you started dating, you didn't have the same behavioral science expertise uh, as you have now. So was there a certain point early on where you became disillusioned with your online dating process? And did you try to disrupt it or hack it or change your approach or attitude toward it? Can you tell me about that? Sure, yeah, so in the beginning with dating, um, I think the first night I downloaded Tinder, I swiped for six hours straight. <laughs> and I really saw the addictive tendencies of it. And I made Which a, direction, by the way? Probably, mostly left. Okay. <laughs> that, that's, that's the no. So I really saw how addictive it was, and I realized I was going on tons of dates, so were other people, we were having trouble. And is anyone in the audience familiar with attachment theory? Have you heard of that? I see a few hands. So it's actually a really interesting part of relationship science called attachment theory. It's basically the idea that uh, people are attached in three different ways. So if you're securely attached, you're comfortable with intimacy, and you like to be close, but you also like your alone time. If you're anxiously attached, then you constantly want to be in touch with the person, and you're always nervous that they're going to leave you. So those are the people that text nonstop. And then if you're avoidant, attached, then you feel like somebody's smothering you and that when you get into a relationship, you're going to lose your independence. So what happens is that it's really great to be in a relationship with a secure person. About 50% of the population is secure, but they get snatched up pretty quickly. So you have the rest of the population dating each other. These people that text tons of times, texting the person who feels like being in a relationship smothers them. So you have these anxious, avoidant relationships. And I'm definitely anxiously attached. I'm the person sending tons of text messages. And I found that I was constantly dating people who were avoidant. And what happens is that you're actually experiencing anxiety, but you think that it's chemistry. Mm. It's a very common misconception. And I did a lot of work. I read the book Attached. I actually worked with a dating coach myself. And I realized, oh, I don't want to be with somebody avoidant. I'm, I don't want to be obsessed with the chase. This is actually anxiety. And I worked to find somebody who was secure. And I actually just got engaged a month ago. So, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So, yeah, through that work, I was able to figure out, oh, I'm sort of addicted to this chase. And I found someone who was secure. And it was a completely different type of relationship. I remember the first time I tried to get into a fighting text with him, sort of rage texting him. <laughs> Instead of responding and, and picking up that fight, he said, hey, let's talk about this when you get home. It's just mind-blowing. <laughs> and so I highly recommend learning about attachment theory and reading this book, Attached. And if you are somebody who struggled with this stuff, trying to find someone who's secure, and the book gives more information on that, is, can really help you shift your behavior so much. Cool. Thank you, Logan. Yeah. Appreciate it. Thank you. We're going to take some questions from the audience. We have some with microphones. Good. Great. I think Hi. in the back there. Uh, is this on? OK. Uh, first of all, thank you for presenting this stuff. Uh, I just wanted to ask, besides point five, the one with the Prince Charming and his morning breath, all of them seem to be addressed to people with low self-esteem issues. So what about the people with high self-esteem issues and well-adapted? <laughs> you know, the people that know what they want. <laughs> uh, sorry, what was the question? Can you... How are Can confident you? people, uh, do you have any tips for confident, high self-esteem issued people to date? Sorry, is the question how to deal with if you don't have high self-esteem? Uh, if you don't have low self-esteem. Can you say the question? Uh, I'm not sure. Are, are you saying tips for dating somebody who has their too much high esteem or you have too much high esteem? No, I have super high self-esteem, but I still have problems dating, so... Ah. Do you have any tips for me? What, maybe, maybe be more specific about what the problems are? Like, uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, should we lower our expectations sometimes? Do you think that's a good idea? Like a middle ground? I, I can't understand. So I have never confused someone so, so much So you're in my saying life. You, she has very high self-esteem yeah. and has problems dating and thinks perhaps, should she lower her expectations, or is it an inner perception? Thank you. Sure. Okay, thank you for translating. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, sometimes I struggle <laughs> with sorry. the accent. <laughs> okay, so 
uh, the question is about high expectations, and this is really fascinating. So high expectations are often helpful because you set higher standards for yourself and others, and then you're more likely to reach them. At the same time, the research shows that people who have unrealistically high expectations of relationships end up getting disappointed in relationships when they end up inevitably hitting a rough patch. So there's two types of mindsets around this. One is called the destiny mindset, the idea that you're gonna find your soulmate and everything is gonna be perfect. And the other is called the growth mindset, the idea that relationships take work and that together you're gonna be able to get through these hard moments. So people who have really high expectations of a relationship, of themselves, of their partner, they often have these destiny mindsets. And it's good in the beginning because they're really happy during the honeymoon stage, but once things get a little tough, they're actually not prepared to deal with those hard moments and those relationships actually struggle. So the answer is to have sort of a compromise. You should have high expectations for how you feel in the relationship. So when I'm around this person, do I feel confident? Do I feel funny? Do I feel smart? Do they make me feel comfortable? Do I want them in my home? But that's not the same thing as having a resume list of all of the traits that they should have. So I really work hard with my clients to get them to drop requirements like how old the person needs to be, how tall the person needs to be. Because when you look at the science of what makes a great relationship, those are not the things that matter. So I would say have high expectations around how the person makes you feel, but have either different or eliminate your expectations around that person's resume or biographical qualities. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you for that question. Uh, okay. Okay, so I have a question related to your number one. Don't talk to your ex. Because um, I actually had a very long relationship, like 10 years. And uh, we were friends. We were, then we upgraded next level. <laughs> and um, I ended the relationship. I had a closure. But from time to time, we speak. He calls, just saying, what do you do? How are you? And how is that good or not good? Well, you tell me. How's your relationship now? <laughs> what? Are you in a relationship now? Uh, exactly now, no. <laughs> uh. Not right now. But I've been in another relationship, and it was OK, actually. It was right. really OK. So for the slide the guy and, and for the presentation, <laughs> you know, I said, point blank, stop talking to your ex. And I think for a lot of people, that's the message that they need to hear because they do this thing called orbiting where they keep a lot of their exes kind of orbiting around them so that when they get lonely or bored or they you know, want to hook up, they keep somebody in their orbit so that they can access them and it's actually holding them back. Obviously, it's not that black and white. There are situations where maybe you have a child with your ex and you need to keep in touch with them. Or maybe you were really good friends before. In your case, you became... Uh, more than friends, and then you want to go back to being in a relationship, I think that's possible. With my clients, I set a rule of around, I think you should take six months off from speaking. I think that's enough time to really move on, uh, start dating new people, this and that, and then maybe you can add your ex back into your life. But I would really see when your ex is in your life, how does that make you feel? And for some people, it's just not appropriate for them to keep seeing their ex. So it depends on the situation, but I would say just check in with yourself. When you hang up on the phone with your ex, do you feel better or do you feel worse? And really tune into that to decide, is there a place for that person in your life? Okay, thank you. Hello. Hi. <laughs> he likes that, that side of the room. <laughs> okay, so um, I've had actually two relationships, committed relationships started on Tinder. They didn't end well, so I'm not using the app anymore. But uh, my question for you is, uh, having a growth mindset, when do you know it's time to actually get out of a relationship? Yeah, great question. So actually, in terms of the original research that I've done, a ton of it is actually on breakups and this question of should I mend it or should I end it? So I could go on and on about this for a long time. I will give you a shortened version. So of course, there are some people that get out of relationships at the appropriate time. But I find that there's often two categories of people when it comes to breakups. One is called the overditcher. These are people that ditch the relationship way too quickly and they end things when they're just getting started. So maybe after the three or four month mark when people start getting a little bit more real and the honeymoon period is over, suddenly they leave the relationship. Those are often the people that are avoidantly attached. And what I say to those people is, 
Relationships go through up and down. The only way to learn how to be in a long-term relationship is to actually be in one. And so I say to the over-ditchers, stop leaving after that short period of time and actually ride it out and give it a chance. There's another category that I call the over-hitchers. Those are people that stay in relationships too long. Those are often people that are anxiously attached. And part of the reason is they say, well, if I leave this relationship, maybe I won't find somebody else. So I actually have a question that I ask people when I'm trying to decide whether or not they should stay in their relationship. I'm going to ask it to you, and before I tell you what it means, I want you to just come up with the answer in your head. So I say to people, if your partner were a piece of clothing in your closet, one of the pieces of clothing that you have, what piece of clothing would they be? Okay, I, I heard a sock. So sad. What are, what are some other answers? A sweater? A shirt. So as I've done this research, I've heard a variety of things. One guy told me, my boyfriend is a wool sweater. He keeps you warm, but it's so itchy that you want to take it off. <laughs> Another woman said, my boyfriend is an old t-shirt that you wear to the gym and you hope nobody sees you in it. Oh. And... I think why this question works is it's so kind of random and abstract that it really gets people to access an unconscious part of their mind and they start to say things that really reveal what's going on. So those are examples of negative things. Positive things I've heard are people say, my boyfriend, uh, my girlfriend is my favorite pair of pants that I never would have bought for myself but I really love or uh, my girlfriend is my favorite pair of jeans that fit perfectly or even socks is a great answer. It's about uh, keeping you warm and protected and feeling cozy. So. There's no black and white answer for whether you should stay or whether you should go, but the first thing you should do is to look at your patterns. Do I tend to be an overhitcher or an overditcher? And then you should ask that question about if this person were a piece of clothing in my closet, and that could actually help reveal what's really going on for you. Thanks, Logan. We're out of time, but thank you all so much for the questions. And thanks, Logan. Thank you.